selfie being that reflection and that meditation until we begin to see the image that God has created us in. And that's the purpose of this. And, and I hope that Scripture can begin to come alive to us in a different way. You've heard me say before that I have read the Bible multiple times throughout in different versions every year. And in each time I read it in a different version each year, I purpose and intentionally to read it as if I've never read it before. Because if you read it as you've never read it before, you will have no preconceived ideas or biases, and you won't have any preconceived teachings from anyone else. You will look at it from a new facet that God is going to reveal to you. Do you know there are angels, their sole eternal existence is to go around the throne of God. And every time they come back and see the face of God, they see a different facet that they hadn't seen before and glorify Him new and fresh each moment since the beginning of eternity and until the end of eternity. That every time that they see the face of God, they see something new in God. This is how we should view our our interaction, our our study, and our relationship with Christ is that we make it come alive. And I want to encourage us to continue this practice. And I want to hope that it came more alive to you than it did to Becky. So after service last week, my wife of 32 plus years shared with me what she envisioned while reading Matthew 16, 13 through 20. And just so we can kind of get the gist of the story, and for those that weren't here, let's actually go to Matthew 16, verse 13 through 20. We we read this last week, but I want you to be thinking about this as I share the rest of her illustration. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Amen? And so if you recall last week, for those that were here, I encourage us to to be one of the disciples. Pick one, you know, one of the disciples that were were in this this discussion and and to envision where were they? Were they inside? Were they outside? Were they around a table? Were they around a campfire? Was it cold? Was it hot? Was it breezy? The things, just imagine what could be going on in the atmosphere as we read this particular story. Well, moving on. Becky says, you know, I don't see things the same way that you see when you close your eyes and put yourself in the story. And she said, so while we were going through the exercise, I was imagining how itchy the robes must have been. And then I saw all of the disciples and Jesus around in a circle and me playing duck, duck, goose with them. So if you too experienced a similar creative, imaginative wackiness in your scripture meditation this week, I'm going to tell you reluctantly, it's okay. It is quite all right because no one can tell another person how to live out the scriptural context. And so it just so happens that my wife, who is very creative, and I tell everyone that I will never get old. Never get old. 
because she keeps me young. She keeps me laughing, so the more I laugh, the healthier I am. And so we have, we have a lot of fun, and when she told me that, I was just... You know that look, Zay? You know that look? That's the look I gave her. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> what I love about that response, even though it wasn't what I expected, what I love about that response is that it's pure. It's pure in her experience as she was reading the scripture. I mean, it sounds funny and maybe even some of us go, seriously? But Jesus says unless we come into the kingdom as a child, we will have no part of him. And I think sometimes that we, we don't come into this child enough. We, we don't in our relationship view ourselves as a child. You know, we, we like to quote scripture that says, you know, that we can come boldly to the throne of, of grace, right? And so sometimes we, we think about that as this, we're this big man, you know, hero looking person, and we just walk into the throne room and say, yo, God, what's up? You know, and we just, we expect God to just say, ooh, okay, I'm here to answer all your prayers, James, you know, you know, that McFly person, you know, <laughs> you know, that's not God, but that's how we view ourselves, that we can come in and we can make this demand on God, but to come boldly because in the king's palace, guess who is the only one that can come into the throne room without permission? No, in the king's palace. The heir. The wife can't even come in. But the heir to the throne, guess what? He can come in, she can come in at any time. I mean, we, we think of this, this royalty vision and picture that the king sits on this throne 24-7 with his scepter, you know, and he's pounding it on the ground, you know, making demands of everyone else to go do something. And the kids, just, they just must fall in line in rank and file just like all of the soldiers. But have you ever just envisioned that maybe the children are just running around the throne while the king is trying to be stern and firm and he's passing judgment and a child is playing peekaboo through the armrest? Can you see that picture? Can you envision that? Or he's about to condemn a person and this little baby girl just crawls up in his lap while he's exercising judgment. Doesn't infringe the child in any way, shape, or form. Because the child is an heir to the throne. Only one amen? Maybe it just hasn't clicked. Maybe we just don't quite understand. The child is an heir to the throne and has every right to the throne as the king. So coming boldly into God is not coming in there with our head how high, our shoulders back, and making a demand with God. Coming in is coming in a child because we're playing duck, duck, goose with the king. Because we're trying to come out of our royal robe so that we can be completely vulnerable in his presence. See, we look at that story and we may think, wow, how childish. For an adult to think, but God's saying, that's my child and that's how I see you. That's how I want you to come into my presence. See, we make our walk to be so serious at times that if we're not pious and if we don't have anguish on our face, then we're not religious or holy enough. I see more Christ Christians that have wrinkle lines around their face from frowning than wrinkle lines because they're smiling. You know, they tell us that, that crow's feet and wrinkles around our, our, our mouth are bad. I just say that they're good. It means that you're a happy person. The more you smile, the more you'll squint. The more you smile, the more wrinkles and dimples will form. Society has said those are bad traits. God says those are good. Because we're happy. We make it so serious. Our salvation 
and our sanctification of our souls, it is serious business. I don't want to generalize or demean where we are. But it doesn't have to be staunch. It doesn't have to be stuffy. And it doesn't have to be mechanical. See, even in our prayer times, I'm sure, how many of us, don't, please don't answer this question and don't even look at me. But how many of us, even in our prayer times, we go in there, you know, we have to have this perfect setup, a perfect pillow, a perfect blanket. We have to have this, this perfect posture, you know, and we're like, okay, am I, am I, am I symmetrical to the, to the center of the closet? And, you know, are my hands, are they in perfect position? And oh, Do I go under my chin? Do I go over my chin? Um, where, where do I put these things? And, and we just, oh, oh, God, Heavenly Father, you are so mighty and wonderful and I'm not worthy and oh, but we, we try to make this, this thing that is just so in a box. But remember, when we talked about meditation and reflection, meditation is about creating and nurturing a relational equity with the Lord. God loves us, period. There is no more love. There is no less love. His love is eternal. Always has been, always is, always will be. The scripture is even clear that, that there is an equality that is inseparable with God and love. It says God is love. That's pretty Definite. And so as our language says, is, is one of those words that you can invert the noun and the, and the pronoun. And guess what? Love is God. And so you, they're inseparable in everything. And so when we're, we're talking about this meditation, reflection, when we're spending that time with the Lord, it's about creating and nurturing that relational equity in the Lord. He loves us, Period. Period. He, he loves us so much that he gave his only son. There is no other ransom required for our souls. Period. He satisfied whatever amount that the devil could have put on our lives. Jesus satisfied it. Period. And so God does not have to prove anymore to us that he loves us. None of us would give our child so willingly for the salvation of another human being. You can say you will, but you lie because you have not the capacity of God. That's why we have Jesus. You see, if we had that capacity that God had to give his only first begotten son for the salvation of humans, we wouldn't have needed Jesus because we'd be doing it all the time. But he knew we did not have the capacity to save ourselves, and so he did it for us. So therefore, when we come into this life or into this uh, uh, process of reflection and meditation, it's to nurture our relational equity with Christ, meaning it is to nurture our love for him. It is not to nurture his love for us. You feed a child, you clothe a child, you give a child warmth, you give a child care. Everything that you give a child that stimulates all of their senses, that child looks to you with an absolute unconditional admiration and love. They don't even know what love is, but the child is completely reliant on that. (laughs) But as parents, we do that because we love our children. And we pour, that, we pour that upon them. We pour that into them. But a child has to learn that relational equity. Many of us with our parents, we're still trying to learn that relational equity. We know they love us. They're our parents. But are we confident that our parents know that we love them? Are my children, my children are confident that we love them. But are they confident in themselves? that they love us. As your children get older, you you begin to see this tension in their lives. Doesn't mean they don't love you. They just don't know how to reconcile that they do. 
And it's not until usually when they have their own children that the light actually begins to come on and that they begin to understand what that relational equity is. And really, that's how we are as human beings. We're trying to create and nurture this relational equity with our Lord. We know he loves us, but do we really know that we love him? And so remember the definition that we talked about last week of meditation. It's to dwell in thought on any one thing, to contemplate and study great truths, to resolve any subject in our mind. It's not God resolving that in our mind. It's us resolving it within ourselves as unto him. See, if imagining Jesus chasing you around a campfire circle with all the disciples playing duck, duck, goose draws you closer to him, then so be it. Whatever that looks like for you, so be it. Tony's imagining Jesus playing baseball with him. <laughs> or football. <laughs> Close. However, however we, we can imagine to put ourselves in whatever story and context that draws us closer to Jesus, there's nothing wrong with that. Your creativity and your imagination have been put there for a reason. The root word of imagination is image. And if our imagination draws us closer to the image of Christ in us, there is nothing wrong with that and no one can say any different. See, there's no set method. There's no set plan. There's no pattern or agenda to our relationship in Christ. The problem is we need to stop reading more books on how to be closer to Christ and just start reading the book. I'm afraid that we have come to a, we're in a culture that we spend more time researching the gospel of Google than we do the gospel of Christ. I mean, so much so that when we go into the doctor's office, our doctors can't even diagnose what's wrong with us because we tell them what's wrong with us. Because we've been to WebMD. We've been to WebMD, and we did a search on all 12 of our symptoms, and seven things come up. Three of them are autoimmune. Two of them are related to cancer. Uh, two more are related to some other type of uh, communicable disease that may not be treatable. And the one that it most likely is is the one that we don't tell the doctor. You could just see it on the doctor's face when it says, well, tell me your symptoms. And you can't even get the symptoms out before you say, but I checked it on WebMD, and my WebMD says that I have this. And the doctor goes, dear God, help me. That means anything that the doctor tells you in the diagnosis, you won't receive. Because we have already received the diagnosis from WebMD. This is the same thing that happens when we talk about Scripture. The first place we go to is the gospel of Google or the gospel of whoever or even our friend or neighbor who supposedly has all the knowledge of the Bible. And whatever they tell us, that becomes the gospel truth. And then when somebody actually opens the Bible and reads the Scripture to you and tells you what it is, we don't believe it because our friend didn't say that. Because the web didn't say that. Because everything on the web is true. Everything we read in the news is the truth. See, so we spend all of our time creating an imagination of an image that is not God. It's an image of everything else but not Jesus. And so I'm okay with you looking at Jesus running with you through a field. As hokey as it may be, if that draws you closer to the image of Christ in you, your hope of glory, who am I to say any different? If that draws you into a faithfulness that you've never known before, who am I to say any different? If it compels you into silence and solitude and reflection and meditation in God's word, who am I to say any different? The problem is we don't allow ourselves to go there because it doesn't fit a plan. It doesn't fit a pattern. You know, one of the common questions that people ask me when they find out that I've been in this for any length of time, and you guys have heard some of bits and pieces of this, is they want to know how much time in prayer do I spend? How much time in Bible reading do, do I spend? Because you would think that, that this would be through some regimented three to five hours a day. Guys, I don't have three to five hours a day to read the Bible or to pray. See, I don't, have, I don't have a set, you know, two hours where to read and pray and, and just completely meditate every day on the Word. So that means I have to do it in 24 hours. 
Meaning, it has to be done all day. And see, the, the reason why we don't even do it for a portion of our day is because someone told us that you got to do it first thing in the morning and you got to do it for an hour. And if you don't read your, the, the word according to this and you don't pray according to this and if you don't do it this way, well, then you're not going to be complete and you're not going to be fulfilled. There is no plan except for no plan. If you have no plan at all to read the word, to, 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 to meditate in prayer and to to worship God, if there is no plan and no intentionality, then there will be none. But when I say plan, it doesn't mean that you have to put it on your schedule. It just means be intentional about it. See, throughout our day, we have moments of idleness. And I didn't bring it in here. But we even catch ourselves doing this. In that moment of idleness, you're stopped at a red light. And a red light, instead of praying to God, we pull out our phone. I'm going. You always know the person in front of you that is on their phone at a stoplight. Or even worse, you're at lunch, you're in the drive through We need to pray for Lionel. <laughs> you didn't see his face. Yes. <laughs> but we're sitting in the drive through right? It's like, oh, I, I want to order. I got 20 minutes and Whataburger takes 30. Come on, move it, buddy. And they're just like this. <laughs> but when we have these idle moments, what do we spend it doing? In our today's culture, we pull out our phone, and that's the first thing we do. And you are not reading Scripture. I guarantee it. See, we are, we are creating a completely different image than the image that Jesus is trying to, to restore. You understand he's trying to restore this image. He's not trying to create a new image. He already knows who you are. He already knows what you look like in God's creation. He's trying to restore it in this thing up here above your shoulders. He's trying to restore you to think on that. He's trying to restore you to see what he sees. He's trying to restore that image so that our imagination can be reflective of him. See, loving him and loving our neighbors won't always look the same for all people. I don't love my neighbors like you love yours. I don't express that love the same way. We don't even love our spouses the same way. It looks different because our spouses are different. We don't, we don't love in, in other relationships or, 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 or relation, even friendship relationships. We don't show that same type to the same person because each relationship is different. If you have more than one child, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you try to raise all three of your children in the exact same block, square, circle, whatever it is, you will have two that will rebel. One will go, yeah, give me more. The more regimented you are, you have that one that is like, yes, you know, feed me more input, more information, and and they're there. And you got the other two go, square, block, circle, I don't understand. This goes in here and it won't fit. How do we nurture how do we nurture that child? Because it's a different relationship. We've seen that in all three of our children. And so we realize that we can't give them all the expressive things that they need that are necessary for them to be adults. We can only give them the framework. They have to develop what that, what that expression looks like. You've heard me say this before. It's just like building a house. When you put the foundation, you put in the walls, you put on the roof, for all intents and purposes, the house is done. Right? You can go underneath it and you can stay dry. It'll keep out the sun. It may not keep you cool, but it'll keep out the sun. For all intents and purposes, you have a foundation, the walls, and you have the roof. The house is built. Everything else is expression. Adam can build us 20 houses with the exact same floor plan. And we put 20 different people in each one of those houses. All 20 of them will look exactly different. Yeah, that was on purpose. Only Shirley caught that. It will look exactly different. It is exactly the same floor plan, but to look at it, you would not know that it's the, same, the exact same floor plan because each person has a different flavor and a different expression. And we should say, thank 
God. If you've ever lived in military housing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your neighbor has the exact same house. I'm talking exact same house. The only thing different is it says Sergeant Miller versus Sergeant Jones. That's it. There wasn't a single house on Fort Hood that I couldn't walk in and know my way around. I knew where the bathroom was. Nobody ever had to tell a military kid where the bathroom was in somebody else's house. You just went because you knew where it was. You see, loving God and loving our neighbors will never look the same for all people. He created us intentionally different and un- intimately unique. Let's go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1. Psalm 139 and verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet... There was none of them. God knows us. See, the purpose of the selfie app that we've been talking about, along with the privacy app, is not to put anyone in a box. It's not to give us a seven-step plan for our best life now. It is only a framework to create an atmosphere of silence, solitude, reflection, and meditation where we will have the best opportunity to know Christ. And even more, to know the power of his resurrection. That was Paul's plea, to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Jesus even said, or or, or Paul even says later, says the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. There's got to be a connect point to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the same power that raised him from the dead rest in you. Something tells me that we're supposed to have power. Something tells me we're supposed to have authority. Something tells me we're supposed to be anointed. Something tells me we're supposed to be a a lot farther into this than what we are. You know, I, I like to think that I'm a pretty smart man and pretty intelligent man. But I still understand that, man, I should be a lot farther into this myself. There's got to be something deeper. There's got to be something more. To know him in the power of his resurrection. Because in knowing him in the power of his resurrection, it will be the true reflection of him in our generation. Our world doesn't know him in the power of his resurrection. Because we don't know him in the power of his resurrection. Where are they going to see the power of his resurrection? Except for in his people. His body walking out in the power and authority of that resurrection. And so we must be the reflection of that power, that anointing, his resurrection, his gospel, his love, his grace, his mercy in our generation. Let's go to Psalm 62. Psalm 62, beginning in verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. The psalmist understands and knows clearly, as we talked about last week, whom he is in God. See, having a clear clear picture of who we are in Christ only comes through spending time with Christ. 
Some of us are a reflection of Walmart because that's where we spend most of our time. Some of us are a reflection of whatever our favorite Netflix or Hulu or Vudu show that we've been binging on for the past two weeks. Some of us are a reflection of our clothes. Some of us are a reflection of our, our, our possessions. Some of us are a reflection of everything except for the reflection of whom we are supposed to be. And that is because where we spend our time, where we invest our imagination, will create our image. And I say that again. Wherever we invest in our imagination, that will create our image. That will be what people see. Having a clear picture of who Christ is only comes through spending time with him. The more time we spend in and with the word, the more we become the word. John 1, 1 through 4. John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the, and the, was with God and the, was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word. It's, we, don't, we don't make the association. When we talk about reading Scripture, we think of it as just reading ink on paper. Or in today's world, looking at words on a screen. We, 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 we struggle with making the association that the very Scripture we read is the Word of God. And according to John, that Word is Christ. So when we read the Scripture, we are reading Christ. Y'all really don't know how this works, do you? Listen, you're not aiming amen in me for my sake. If you're getting it, you should be excited. You, sh you, 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 should, you should be just ecstatic that you understand his word. Paul tells us that all wisdom and all mystery has been given to us in Christ Jesus. There is nothing that is hidden from us. God has poured out his son. He's poured out his word into all the earth and all of his word exists in his church. One day we, the church, will get this. Not Trinity Christian Center. I'm talking about the body of Christ will get this and will understand this and we will begin to see our world changed. I just pray for us in the U.S., that it's not when we become oppressed. See, we are not the most advancing member of the body of Christ in the world today. I hope everyone understands that. The United States church, the Western church, is not the fastest growing advancing kingdom church in the world. The body of Christ, the members of the body of Christ who are advancing the kingdom more rapidly are the ones who are being oppressed in other countries. The fastest growing right now, surprisingly to many because you don't hear it on the news, is in the Middle East. Where Allah has failed them. And someone has told them about Jesus, whom they know about but they are learning is there for them, is learning a different, a di actually, they're learning about the real Jesus and not the one that they've been taught. And it is changing and transforming their lives. China still has one of the fastest growing populations of the Christian church because of oppression. Because it's so far deep underground, we don't even know how many believers are in China. But it is one of the fastest growing in the world. Every part of the world where the, the word is being oppressed, the word is growing at rapid rates. 
That's not a fear. That's not a scare. We are, we are complacent. We are lazy in the West. That's why when we talk about these words, they don't excite us. They don't, they don't stir us. They don't motivate us. Yeah, we heard this before. I read my Bible. I know what it says. I don't have to come to church. I don't have to fellowship with anybody else. I don't need anybody but Jesus. As long as, long as Jesus knows my heart, we're cool. Right? That's it. As long as he knows my heart, we're cool. Christ Jesus is God's word, and the word is Christ Jesus. They are inseparable. When we reflect and meditate on God's word, we are in the presence of Christ. When we reflect and meditate on God's word, we are in the presence of Christ. This solitude in him builds up our most holy faith, according to Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. You know, I didn't share this. It's, it's just because I, 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 I don't want things to, to always be about my practices and, and what got here. But it's the only thing that I can share with you because I know it works. It's a testimony of my faith. Do you know that there were several years when I've read through Scripture that I read every Scripture out loud? When I read this and said that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God, I took it literal. And for several years, every time I read the word, I read it out loud. So that way my ears can hear it and my soul can receive it. Maybe some of us need to start reading out loud like we did when we were in kindergarten, first and second grade. There's a reason why we read it out loud. Do you know the reason why you read it out loud? You think it's so that your teacher could under, knew that you understood what you were reading. No, it's so that you can actually grow in your thinking. See, the more that we read, the more knowledge we have. The more that we hear what we're reading, the more wisdom we apply. We can fill this thing with everything, but until it becomes rhema, until it becomes life, until it becomes something that is functional and practical and usable in our life, it never comes alive. Reading the Word is of no value if it's never applied. The scripture can no longer be, as I said earlier, ink on paper, letters on screens, or just words we read. We must live the word. It must be alive in us so that it will flow out of us. See, John 1 is just not a pretty saying for God to just tie everything in a nice bow. Everything that was spoken in creation came from the Son. And so who was the best to reconcile creation back to Father was the one who spoke it into existence to begin with. See, God didn't do anything by accident. Jesus wasn't plan B. Jesus was the plan from the beginning. He's always been the plan. Reflection and meditation in the Word through the Holy Spirit empowers the, us to boldly witness the gospel in our generation, according to Acts 1. And we can only give an account, testify, and be a witness to that which we have firsthand knowledge of. If you didn't see a crime, you can never be a witness. If you didn't see something good happen in a person's life, it's difficult to celebrate with them. It's difficult to declare. I remember I was in a a, a service one time, and, and I have to be careful. And there was a, a minister in this service who happened to be known for gold and silver dust fillings in people's mouths. So people who had dental issues would see this minister and the minister would pray and they would get silver fillings in their teeth and they would get gold fillings in their teeth. And... Uh, you know, I, I, if you're in the, the Pentecostal charismatic circles for any length of time, you hear a lot of this stuff, okay? And just as a qualifier, I will never, ever limit God to what he could potentially do, okay? So I, wa- I want to qualify that. So, so I'm sitting in this service, right, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching these events take place and he got wind that I was there and that I was the district youth director 
And so he's ministering to this person, and he's all up in this person's mouth. And uh, he calls me up here. He goes, oh, man, look at these brand new, bright, shiny silver fillings. Right? And he's telling the church about all these, these brand new silver fillings in this person's mouth. And, and this person's talking about how they, they didn't have anything. They couldn't afford to go to dentist. And now they have these silver fillings. And he goes, youth director, you got to come up and see this, right? And I'm just looking at him like, God, you don't want me to come up there. Because I, I'm not going to say what you want me to say if I don't see what you say I'm supposed to see. And so I walked up there and I looked in, in, in that person's mouth. And they go, you see those pretty shiny silver fillings and I said no he didn't even acknowledge me turned his back and just kept on going I walked back to my seat afterwards a lot of people came to me go you didn't you didn't see them I go I can I've never made it a habit of lying (laughs) he asked me a question Did I see those brand new silver fillings in this person's mouth? And no, there were no brand new silver fillings. That person's mouth still looked as rotten as it was before. (laughs) I don't know if me coming up there was supposed to instantly transform them into that or not. I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm not limiting God. I'm just telling you that we can't focus on those things Because they are not the power and authority of the word. See, we must live the word in us. It must be alive in order for it to flow out of us. The Holy Spirit has empowered us to boldly be a witness of our generation. I could not be a witness to that because I did not see it. Others who may have, they could be a witness. But I did not see that. So I could not testify any other way. See, we can only give an account and testify and be a witness to that which we have firsthand knowledge of. The reason that we don't walk this life as the early church did is because we don't spend the time in communion with Christ as they did. They didn't have phones. Imagine the amount of time that we spend on phones just in a day. Computers. They didn't have that. If those were gone tomorrow, what would you do with that time? If they didn't have TVs, how much time do we spend in a TV? Well, now we're not even spending time in front of the TV. We're spending more time on a device that can access TV shows. So again, how much time are we spending on these things that they didn't have? You didn't get a choice, and neither did I, to be born in a different time Okay, We were born in this time, but that does not give us an excuse to neglect the things that are essential and important in our walk with Christ. See, we don't walk out the same in this life as the early church did because we don't spend the time in communion with Christ as they did. That's that's not anything else but what it is. (laughs) And only you and I as an individual can figure out what that looks like and how we can change it. See, these were people who were close to God's heart. They understood reflection and meditation. They would invest their time, talent, energy, and resources to knowing Him more. God spoke to them not because they had special abilities. I'm going to say that again. God spoke to them not because they had special abilities. Because you're a pastor doesn't mean you have special abilities. Matter of fact, I will be the first to admit you are more equipped to be up here than I am. You're just terrified to do the job. And you should be. It's not a special ability that God gives a certain person in discernment or he gives a certain person in wisdom or knowledge or judgment. I've shared this with several people. I was an average student in high school. Average. And one of the first things is I read in the scripture when Solomon became king and he told the Lord, I don't want riches. I don't want fortune. I don't want fame. I don't want affluence. I don't want all of those things. I just want your wisdom to make righteous decisions. 
And I read that and I said, Lord, that's me. I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be wealthy. I don't want to have all these things. But I want to have wisdom like I'd never had before. I want to have discernment in things so that I can be a wise leader and I can, I can exercise things in judgment, not to judge, but things that are in good judgment. I, that's what I prayed. And over the course of my adult Christian life, guess what? God has honored that. Amen. It's not because I have a special ability. And no one throughout the scriptures have any special ability to hear God's voice. But because they were intentional in their willingness to listen. They were intentional in spending time with him. They were intentional that when they read his word, they said, I got to have that. Have you ever read God's word and been so desperate for what God said? That you would spend day and night meditating on that particular scripture. And I'm not talking about wealth. I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm not talking about success. I'm not talking about healing. I'm talking about just being a man of God. A woman of God. That Lord when people see me. Remove me out of the equation. Let their eyes see you. That God when, when, when I speak. It's not my voice. But it's your word. The scripture said you sent them out in Matthew 10 and Luke 10 and you told them don't take no scripture. I will give you what you need to say at the appointed time. Lord, let that be me. Give me the timely wisdom to impart and impact somebody's life for the kingdom. Are you intentional in your willingness to listen? And if we're not spending time with him, we're not intentional. That is a fact. If we spend more time in everything else, as I've said already before, that is the image that we are creating. If we spend more time in Christ, trust me, the image that you will become is the one that he created you to be. Not only did they hear and listen to God's word, they faithfully obeyed. They faithfully obey. Reflection and meditation, remember, as I said this over the past couple weeks, it refines, it shapes, and prepares us to obey God's word. 1 Samuel 15, 22, in there it says, to obey is better than sacrifice. God wants communion with us because he loves us. And we love him. His commandments are nothing more than pure and simple obedience. And what does that look like? Love him, love people. That's it. Pure and simple. Nothing more, nothing less. It's to obey him in his commandments. To love him and love people. Jesus modeled this in John 5, 19. The son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likely. John 14, 10. The words that I say to you... Speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Jesus is our example. Now that Christ dwells in us, we must continue to walk in the same authority of the Father by the Holy Spirit. The authority of God is manifested through our obedience to him. The more we obey God's word, the more we will experience his authority and power in our lives, our circumstances, and our generation. The more time we spend with him, we will experience everything he has set for us. You've heard me say before, the prodigal son is not a story in a picture of someone who was once saved and went out and was lost and came back. The prodigal son is a picture of our reconciliation. We were lost in the garden. God gave Adam and Eve their inheritance when he created them. And they squandered that inheritance. They gave over their righteousness to the enemy. The prodigal story is that when Christ came, we, the prodigals, came back in Christ Jesus. And he gave us our inheritance. Wait a minute. He already gave you your inheritance. Listen, God is is infinite. The man only got the inheritance as it was apportioned for that moment. While the son was away, the man didn't gain any more inheritance. Why we have been lost, God has not apportioned 
or proportioned everything from the time that we were lost until we got saved to be poured out upon us? Y'all aren't getting this. You're not getting this. You're not getting this at all, period. The father's wealth did not cease when he gave his son his inheritance. His wealth continued to grow, and when the son came back, he still had an inheritance. Everything that the father had grown from the time the son was gone to the time he came back is now his. Everything that was proportioned for you and I since the beginning until the time that we came unto Christ has been proportioned for us to receive. Some of you have not received your inheritance yet. Like, oh, okay, y'all don't get it. Father, I just pray that while they're taking their nap and after their bellies are full, I pray, Lord, that you slap them in the face and wake them up, and this becomes revelation knowledge to them. <laughs> Father, they're hearing my voice and not your voice. I know what it is. The more we obey God's word, the more we'll experience his authority and power in our lives, our circumstances, and our generation. Christ Jesus said in John 2, 19, that he will destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. He wasn't speaking of a physical temple or an institutional church facility. He was speaking of the power and authority of his presence, which formerly and temporarily rested on the mercy seat of the Ark of Covenant behind a veil. That presence will reside and dwell and occupy eternally in the heart of man. God's presence no longer dwells at a place or in a thing. His presence dwells in each of us, in you and I. In other words, as we intentionally reflect and meditate on God's word, we will find ourselves in the presence of God. His seed of mercy now rests in us. This is where his glory is. We always go around looking for the Shekinah glory to fall. You know what? That's got to be the most stupidest thing that God has ever heard us say. Because the Shekinah glory is in us. Christ is on the mercy seat. And if Christ is on the mercy seat and Christ is in our heart, we are the mercy seat. That's where the Shekinah glory is. It's in you. Dear God, help me. It no longer falls from heaven. It flows from within his body, his church. You and me is where the Shekinah glory flows through. We're too busy looking up for the Shekinah glory to come down when we're supposed to be reflecting in and meditating so we can come out. And y'all know I'm not mad. I'm just passionate. We gotta stop looking for God's presence in the sky. You and I are his presence in our generation. That's why we're called the body of Christ and not the ghost of Christ or not the wannabes of Christ. We are his body. He is the head. That means his presence is in us and we are his presence. We are the reflection and meditation in God's word that is released and manifested out there. His presence, his glory and authority comes through us. The Puritan, William Penn, wrote this. True godliness does not turn men out of the world, but enables them to live better in it and excites their endeavors to mend it. When was the last time you were excited to advance the kingdom and change your community for God? See, we become more equipped to respond in Christ as we walk out our lives with other humans. It gives us a clearer picture of what he sees so we can respond as he did. Reflection and meditation in God's word equips us to deal with our ordinary natural world in extraordinary and supernatural ways. We are not flesh. We are not carnal. We are spirit. That's according to the scripture because Christ is in us. We no longer operate in the sins of the flesh. We operate in the spirit. So we must bear the fruit of the spirit. But that won't happen if we're not spending time in the spirit. Finally, reflection and meditation nurtures a new language and voice full of creative power. See, our language and our voice is already creative, but reflection and meditation, spending time with God, changes that language and voice to his language and his voice. No longer are we going to speak out of our carnality, but we'll speak out of the overflow of our spirit. 
So instead of the creating negative things in our life, we're going to create positive and good things in our life. Instead of creating evil and destruction and desolation in our life by the words that we say, we're going to create life and more abundantly. This must be too much. I should have cut this up in smaller pieces. I'm trying to give you all the whole cow, I guess. Okay, we'll pause for a sailor so you can chew. We spend too much time chasing after man's regurgitation of God's prophetic word. We expect a man to have all the wisdom of God and speak to us about everything God has for us instead of putting in the time, energy, and resources to seek it out ourselves. 1 Corinthians 13, 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. 1 Corinthians 14, 32, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The only one who has a clear and full picture of your life is Christ. I don't have a clear and full picture of your life. And coming to me, expecting, to, expecting me to give you a prophetic word about your life, is you're selling yourself short. Because I only see a small portion of it. And the majority of that portion, you already know. It doesn't add any new value or new revelation. It only confirms what God has already told you. If you really want to know the rest of the picture, or as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, get with God. He has the full picture. A man only sees a glimpse and whatever he perceives to see and hear. How it comes out of his mouth is subject to his own personal filters, bias, and expression. You know what I used to think? And, 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 and it didn't, I didn't put a lot of value into it until it happened to me. I used to think, man, is this guy giving me this word? And is that really the full word? Or is he holding back because he doesn't want me to have something he doesn't have? And I'm like, man, James, that is really selfish. That you, you just don't know. And then I'm, I'm speaking to someone and I'm giving them stuff. And my, the whole time my soul's going, oh, well, that didn't happen for you. God didn't do that for you. And man, I just had to stop. I literally stopped in mid-sentence and had to pray through myself, get over myself, because it wasn't about me and what God did or did not do for me. But the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Whatever's going on in my life will be the filter that I give you a prophetic word. So, dear God, you don't want me to give you a prophetic word. <laughs> let's crack the book and let's go find out what God says himself. Because I can't, I can't change that. Especially the red ones. So yes, it is necessary and essential and mandated that we gather together in Jesus' name. But it is more critical for us to walk in fullness of faith in Christ, to seek him, listen to him, and respond to God's word personally. What happens there? We bring in here. See, we don't have to give someone this prophetic, profound word to make us seem so spiritual. Just tell your neighbor your testimony and your testimony is going to bear witness with them because they're either going through it or they've gone through it already. And we know that God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't treat anyone different than the other. And so, yes, if God did something for you, he can do something for someone else. It may not be the exact same thing. Then never put that on another person. The whole point is this. If God worked on Ron's behalf for whatever he had need of, he's going to work on my behalf for whatever I have need of. They don't have to be the same needs, even though they might be similar. God knows what I have need as, it, as relation to that. He knows what he has need in relation to that. And if we don't spend time with God, we're never going to know what that is. We all who are in Christ Jesus are the prophetic voices in our generation. We just don't use our voice for whatever reason. That's between you and God when you get in your silent time and your solitude time, and your reflection time, and your meditate time for God to reveal to you what that is. That's not for me to tell you what that is. I know what it is in James. And trust me, it's not pretty. Well, you know that I'm preaching to an audience of one up here. Y'all understand that. And if you don't, then you really don't know me. This is not an I have arrived and y'all suck message. This is a I suck message and please don't suck as bad as me. <laughs> y'all understand that? That's actually from the perspective that I look at this. This is where we all are. We all who are in Christ Jesus are the prophetic voices in our generation. God's prophetic word is not limited to a select few individuals that we have put on a pedestal and exalted in an unhealthy and wicked idolatry. We 
Humans have put them up there, not God. Joel 2, 28, Acts 2, 17 are very clear that in the last days, meaning since Christ came and the Holy Spirit was poured out, all sons and all daughters will prophesy. Prophesy is not words of wisdom, words of knowledge. It is speaking the word of truth. It is speaking Jesus because he is true. That means all men and all women will speak the prophetic word of God, speak his truth to be the creative kingdom voice in our earth. We don't see the kingdom advancing in Beville. It's because we're not speaking the kingdom. We're not speaking it in a creative power for it to come to pass. We speak everything negative about our community and nothing positive. I pray the next time that our mouths open up with something negative about our community that is not good and creative, I pray that God makes us sound stupid. Until we learn how to speak in love. We learn how to speak what God's word says. So summarizing what we just talked about in the selfie app in the last couple weeks. Remember I said there was selfie app. It's just a cute way of saying God's reflection and meditation. In his word. In conjunction with what we taught on the privacy app, which is silence and solitude. Being in his presence. Here are the five things that it releases that we've already talked about. This is just a summarize. It releases us to be a witness of the gospel in boldness. According to Acts chapter 1. That upon receiving the Holy Spirit, you will receive power to be my witness. So we have power from our time in silence and solitude and reflection and meditation to be a witness of the gospel. It releases us to listen and obey or listen and respond. I don't always use the word obey because some people don't like it. But nonetheless, it just means to respond. That's it. Respond to what we know to respond to. So it releases us to listen, hear God's voice, and to respond to what his voice is saying. It releases God's presence, glory, and authority. And when I say God's presence, glory, and authority, I'm not talking about something that flows from above. Because that is not scriptural. In Christ Jesus, our hope of glory, it flows out of us. God's presence, his glory, is released in the earth when we spend time with him. Number four, we gain his spiritual response to our natural lives. We have to stop responding or reacting to our natural lives from our canality. We have to respond out of our spirit. Just because everyone else is going left and it looks right, doesn't mean that it is. What does God say about that? And then have the boldness to be God's voice, to be God's presence and power and authority to go the other way. And lastly, it releases God's prophetic voice in the earth. Jesus told those that said, show us a sign that you are the son of God. And he said, there will be no sign except for the signs that have already been given. And here we are seeking after this prophetic voice of God, and God has already given his prophetic voice, named Jesus. And he's put that voice in each one of us. That's where God's prophetic voice resides, and we are that voice in the earth. See, the kingdom is not about me, myself, and I. It's about the image of Christ reflecting through each and every one of us. And this only takes place when we are being transformed by the renewal of our soul, our mind, our will, our intellect, our emotions in Christ Jesus. And remember, Jesus is God's word. Amen. Amen. God be glorified and let every man be a liar. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and your word. Thank you, Father. I, I, I pray that we, we gain a, a clearer understanding. 
And I know we struggle in our humanity. The tension between our flesh and our soul. So I just, I just pray now that your word that is deposited in our, in our thinking, that it begins to take root. That it begins to strengthen and be nurtured. And the more that we feed it, the more that we water it in our time that we spend with you, it will produce the harvest in due season in our lives. It will produce the peace that we seek in any circumstance that we walk through. It will produce the breakthrough that we need in no matter what we're facing. It will produce life giving sustenance not just to us and our family but to all those that we come in contact with thank you Lord that the words of life that Jesus spoke now dwell and reside and occupy in each one of us your body I just pray the Holy Spirit that, that begins to be stirred up in each one of us as Paul told Timothy to stir it up to continue to study to show ourselves worthy to give a testimony worthy to be salt and light worthy to proclaim your truth worthy to be your voice in our generation Father we thank you and we give you the utmost glory and the utmost honor this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before you you are dismissed, just a few quick announcements. Um, this Wednesday, did it come up? All right, good. This Wednesday is, is Fifth Wednesday, and so we are having a family movie night um, at 7. Ooh, did I go to the wrong one? Nope, that should be the right one. That's the wrong one. Let's try that one. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Uh, fifth, fifth Wednesday is movie night, um, so we are going to take all the chairs, put them aside so you can bring blankets, you can bring pillows, put your children, your little ones in PJs, so that way when they fall asleep during the movie, you can take them home and put them right to bed. <laughs> so the church is going to provide uh, popcorn, um, and if you want to provide whatever snacks or drinks that you want, so if you like movie theater candy, bring that, but we will provide the popcorn for you. Anything else? Anybody want to know what we're watching? Yeah. Okay. You were, you were thinking, of course, Lionel was thinking. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, so we are going to watch God's Not Dead 2. So, so if you have not seen it, you can come see it. Invite your friends, your family, your neighbors and to come watch it. If you have seen it, um, I actually personally thought it was better than the first one. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be really, really fun. Um, back up here to, if you are, if you're, it's your first time here um, and you did not get a connect card, uh, please make sure you get a connect card, fill it out and drop it in the offering basket before you leave. We would like to reach out for you or if you want to mark the next steps, um, we would like to connect with you on what those next steps are. <clears throat> Wayne is in the back if you want to raise your hand for a connect card. Those of you that have been coming for a while and you have not filled out a connect card so we can update our system, Please go ahead and get one as well. Fill it out with your current information. Um, Real Talk is going to be Tuesday, September 11th at 6 o'clock here. And then on the 9th, we are going to have a planning meeting. Our planning meeting is going to discuss our, the block party on Halloween or week, the Saturday before Halloween and also breakfast with Santa. So we've been... Several people have been talking about wanting to get a jump start on this. And so we're going to plan both of those events that night. So if you want to be part of it, or I should say, whether you want to be or not, please be here. <laughs> um, we need as many people to participate. The block party, it's a pretty good moving thing. We had a really good success two years ago. Um, but breakfast with Santa is going to take the whole army. <laughs> okay? 